Greetings from Cybertron. This is Soundjack here with another Soundjack's Rambles. And today I am here with Alyssa. Thank you for introducing me. As soon as I was on the ticket to a of my juice, I, I really appreciate that. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, hopefully they responded or, the, or they didn't care to respond to the, the screen. But also we have... Uh, That's all right. First, the first time he's appearing on uh, Soundjack's Rambles, uh, my good friend Noah. How are you today? I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, and today <laughs> that is always that was good. Uh, and today we are talking about the Incredibles, the Disney Pixar film released in 2004. 2004, am I right? I uh, God, yes. That movie's getting old. Yes. Yes. <laughs> End of 20, 2004, um, premiering in the U.S. on November 5th of 2004. Um, but 2004, nonetheless, it is 14 years later, and the sequel, Incredibles 2, will be coming out at the in June. In June, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we wanted to talk about the first movie before we got that movie coming on. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. And... Um, for people that may not know us, since um, he's just appeared in one short in a, a video that happened way a while ago, uh, he's a big old Disney aficionado. So that's me. Yes, you and your. For context on how on how Disney Noah is currently, he is wearing a Ducktail shirt, and there is a My Ear Before Christmas poster behind him right now. So don't forget. Way more Disney than both of us. Oh, is there the, Walt, the Walt Disney Imagineering sweatshirt. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot about your important title now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, yes. And good for you on all that. On that. Um, yeah, no, seriously. Good, good. Pride. But let us get us started by having Noah give us a brief, spoiler-free summary it's 14 years later. Okay. I don't think we need spoiler warnings, but, you know, it's just how we roll with movies on this channel. I'm going to say spoiler warning, but I'm going to really try as hard as I can to be spoiler free. But it's your own fault if you haven't seen the movie at this point. Yeah, really. So it's... Uh, so the movie, in short, deals with the the dichotomy between the fantastic and the mundane. So plot-wise, it's about a family of superheroes that live in an era in which superheroes are illegal, right? That, yeah. Is that the correct term? Yeah, yeah. yeah they've been are, like banned and so, stuff. Um, superheroes are, are banned, they're illegal. And so it's the movie follows Bob Parr, uh, who is Mr. Incredible, who attempts to adjust to, for lack of a better term, uh, muggle life. <laughs> and um, um, he, That's a good way to put it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no secret that he does not like this life. And so the movie is about his want to return to superhero dumb and the challenges that he encounters in this attempted um second coming is that vague enough sure yeah yeah that yeah, sounds good i think so yeah 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 so that's uh that's the incredibles if for some reason you haven't seen it and are watching this um but um before we get into spoiler territory. Um, let's also go over how we first learned about this movie. Alyssa, how did you first learn about The Incredibles? Um, you know, I'm pretty sure I was one of those people who saw it in theaters, so that's how I learned about it. I don't have any, like, particular memory of seeing it in theaters, but, like, I'm, like, 95% sure I saw it when it first premiered. Um, it definitely feels like a movie my parents would have taken me to see. Um, I guess I'd have to ask them if they did, because, like, I'm not 100% sure, but, like, definitely saw, I, I'm, like, positive I saw it. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I re specifically remember seeing it. I remember I was in, I believe, second or third grade, and I remember seeing it, 
in November of 2004, and I was 10, and Dash mm -hmm. in the film is 11. So I remember specifically relating to Dash and thinking, oh, in one year, I will be able to be like Dash. So I specifically remember seeing it back in 2004. Nice. nice. As for me, <laughs> yeah. I, um, I have the biggest... no clue. Oh, yeah. I've, I've, I have no clue how I got introduced to Incredibles. It just happened. <laughs> I've seen it. I don't think I ever saw it in the theaters. But like, I definitely... Sure, we, we are young enough that we were not making our own choices as to which movies we saw yet. That is true. So I imagine that most people that are uh, of our age, the young 20-somethings, um, were taken to this of their family's accord. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. I don't... Um, yeah, I'm but, not... Oh. You know, I shouldn't ask my parents before this if, like, they ever took me to see The Incredibles because I really couldn't tell you if they did or not. Um, I definitely have seen the movie several times before this point, um, but I, I, I cannot tell I, you. I definitely know. I think for this movie, for me, my love of it really came from the home video experience. Um, it was actually, fun fact, this movie was one of the first movies that my family got on DVD. Uh, just remembering how old this movie is. It was a big deal. I mean, I think we might have had some DVDs beforehand, but I remember The Incredibles being one of the first DVDs. Like, we have, to get to give you a big idea of how, how late, I guess, we were, or maybe maybe not, but how late, like, VHSs were still a thing. We have a VHS of Monsters Incorporated, which I think only came out the year before, or two years before The Incredibles. So, no, uh, is that accurate? Um, yes, that is accurate. Sorry, I got, I got confused for a second which one came first, Monsters, Inc. or Nemo. But it was, Mo it was Monsters, Inc., Nemo, Incredibles. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know. I don't think we ever got Finding Nemo on, on, either, either on video or DVD, but we definitely got Incredibles. And it was one of the first Disney movies that I remember that we made the switch from VHS to DVD. Yeah. And I also remember, um, this again is, is stating our age, but you, you remember, uh, when you would listen to either like books on tape or DVDs on tape or on CD, I remember mm -hmm. listening to a narrated version of The Incredibles on a CD. So it was a CD that mm -hmm. went, um, the movie from start to finish, but unlike most of the Disney read-alongs, I think they were called, uh, we just called them books on tape, uh, even mm -hmm. though they're movies. Uh, unlike most of them that were about 10 to 15 minutes, The Incredibles boasted itself as over an hour's worth of goodness. And I specifically remember that the disc from start to finish was one hour and two seconds. Oh man, that is, that is long. Oh. And that CD is, has long been worn out in my family. Mm -hmm. But anyway, very nice. So I think I think it's time for us to jump into uh, the meat of the film itself at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone got any points they want to start? Do we want to just talk about points in the movie, or do we want to go over the characters? Oh no, you got to raise your hand. So uh, I. <laughs> I, I, want, on, I, I want to make sure I only say something after I'm sure it's quality, so I, I will raise my hand. Um, what are we saying? I have, I want to shine a light on the fact that um, before we started recording, we had just talked about how um, the 10th anniversary of Iron Man will be coming up soon. And The Incredibles was released in 2004, before the current Marvel Cinematic Universe began. Before so many of these... Super the Incredibles came out before superhero movies were cool. It's almost as if it was the same thing that happened with Pirates of the Caribbean, which is the sense of pirate films were like a dying art form and, and they were like we'll make one more big pirates film and now it's become a thing 
Same thing with superhero movies. I don't think The Incredibles can take full credit for the boom of the Marvel movies, but I do think it reintroduced um, superhero films to popular culture, um, which I think is an interesting point because, like I've said uh, ad nauseum, The Incredibles came out before any of these superhero movies largely were a thing. Fast forward, I think, what, 14 years? And The Incredibles 2 is coming out. We, since then, have this entire current Marvel Cinematic Universe that I think is almost up to 20 films, starting with 18. 18 is what we currently have before um, Infinity War comes out. Uh, we I know this number specifically because Alyssa and I were on a podcast on the Steel City Boss channel. You should go check that out. Uh, and me, us two, and two other people were category listing all eighteen movies by our personal favorites, and then categorizing which of the hosts that were there overall. How do we rank? Right. Them? Not and obviously. So not only do stuff. we have not only do we have these Marvel movies, but we also have the X Men. We have the entire DC universe as well that has popped up in the last fifteen years. So I think it'll be very interesting to see the differences between the Incredibles original and the Incredibles 2 um, due to this um, almost pop culture drowning in mm -hmm. superhero movies. Because if you think back to the Incredibles, I'm trying to think of some examples from the film. Um, the idea of a family saving a town with superpowers or a city, rather, uh, was not common. And now I dare you to list less than five superhero movies that don't, that in the last 10 years, that do not end with a band of superheroes saving New York or Chicago or Boston or some famous fictional city that happens to look like that. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see the changes um, from the original to the sequel because of the culture sh culture change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think that's definitely a good point. I mean, I think up until that point, the only like notable like big successful uh, superhero movies that have been out at the time were the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, and um, like that was pretty much it. Like for the most part, the '90s were not good superheroes at all for the most part, except for Blade. Plays an exception, but um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely a, good, a point that a lot has changed since the Incredibles first came out. Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely was also a big step for Pixar, too. It was the first time they had ever animated uh, humans. Up until that point, it had always been inanimate objects or well, they had, animals. Didn't they, did they not animate like, any humans like, in Toy Story? Woody and Jesse. Well, they, yeah, they, did they, have they, people. they animated people, but they were they were plot devices. This was the first movie that focused primarily on humans as the Okay, subjects. I get what she's saying now. Yeah, and let's be honest, for the most part, Andy in the, like, especially in Toy Story 1, kind of looks a little rough. <laughs> Can you watch yeah. that again? Yeah. A little bit, like, not not too bad, but, like, Definitely, I can definitely when you can see that now that they had to make the, but I mean like having Andy mm -hmm. look kind of fake in in Toy Story wasn't like a big deal because he doesn't have a lot of screen time, but in The Incredibles you had to make the humans look good otherwise it would all fall apart. So, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought that was that that was a, to me that's a big note for for Pixar at least. Yes. Um. But why don't we get started on actually talking about the movie itself, yes. not just the context. <laughs> so, where do we want to start, exactly? Um, why don't, uh, no. oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, go Sorry. for it. Uh, for those you're, of you, you're fine, go me, for it. All of you. Go for it. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we should start at the beginning. Uh, very good place to start, yeah. Yeah. Um, because the movie starts out with this kind of faux documentary mm -hmm. where Mr. Incredible, in his youth, 
talks about sometimes he would like to just settle down and raise a family. Mm -hmm. um, but they cut then to Mrs. Incredible, who is then Elastigirl, um, and she says, like, are you kidding me? Would I have, why would I ever want to do that? She says, uh, uh, leaving the saving the world to the men, I don't think so. And I think it's very interesting the way that the very first thing you see in the movie is them posing these very strong opinions and then jumping almost immediately 15 years later to see that Mr. Incredible has settled down and hates it. Um, and Mrs. Incredible has uh, grown much more accustomed um, mm -hmm. to, again, muggle life. And she's really embraced... Um, Raising a family. So it's funny how they set up standards that they immediately turn on their head. And I think that that is something that the movie does uh, consistently. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah. very, very true. It is, they do do a good job with like setup and yeah. payoff, too. It's also um, very, uh, uh, around the similar time of the like whole showing off Mr. Incredible um, doing his things is very cool even though it's all in the same day it's very quickly established mr incredible is loved by the people that he knows because of the saving the people and then the police thanking him for stopping the robber and then just a little bit later um well we also get introduced to the last girl knowing that they know each other from the wedding obviously but then immediately the next two things are things that he gets sued over just making just mm -hmm. Make sure that you don't just need to know, oh, he's a superhero, of course he's loved, but they do properly establish he is loved before everything comes crashing down. And also, to, yeah. to put to point out yet another thing in the first 15 minutes, is I think one of the strongest points in this film, it's not unique to this film, but it is a very strong point, that uh, the superhero, the, the protagonist, directly creates his antagonist. Yes. He mm -hmm. creates syndrome by not allowing Buddy to accompany him and mm -hmm. therefore crushing his dreams of working with Mr. Incredible and, you know, and yep. it continues. Um, mm -hmm. Did we say spoiler alert? <laughs> yeah, I said this is the... It's beat of, yeah. Um, yeah. It's fine. It's 14 um, years old. Yeah. It's your own fault. Um, if you haven't seen it yet. But I think, yeah. again, it's not the only movie that does it, but I think it's very effective use of that trope. Yes. Of um, the commonly used phrase of don't make people into heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, mm -hmm. it's literal. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are you going to say something, Melissa? Oh, yeah. One of the things I also really like about that exchange in the early parts of the movie is that you... I think there's, you, you see both, at least for me, I see both Buddy and the Mr. Incredible side of things. Like, on one hand, I totally get Buddy, like, really being excited, really wanting this guy to be his hero, and I understand why he got crushed, and, you know, Mr. Incredible was pretty, like, oh, this kid, so that can, and as a kid, that can be a real, real downer for you. Especially for someone you admire so much. But at the same time, I also really understand where Mr. Incredible is coming from. Like, this kid, you know, even though he can, he made rocket boots, he's still a kid. You know, he doesn't have the same kind of, you know, fighting expertise or even, and even though superpowers, it, it, even though, you know, there's, I guess, prejudice against people who doesn't superpowers might play a thing. But at the same time, Buddy clearly is not capable of taking care of himself in some scenarios. So. I understand why Mr. Incredible would want a kid as a liability while he's out saving the world. So, while we're on this topic of but of um in, of first interacting with the villain syndrome as a kid, I I want to bring up something I realized in the watching of it I had with Alyssa last night, which is kind of separate, mm -hmm. but like it's an interesting connection I made. So when um, what's her actual name? Mrs. Incredible's actual name, uh, Helen. 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 Helen yeah. yeah, yeah. Helen is bringing Dash home after the principal's office fiasco. Uh, well, fiasco for the teacher, not for Dash. Uh, 
he she yeah. makes it he's cautioning like why do we have superpowers if we can't use them and it's like and she responds it's like uh, everyone's special and then he says that's just another way of saying no one's special and then very later on in the film syndrome's plan is to once he retires from being a superhero to sell off all of his weapons to people so everyone can be superheroes so then no one is a superhero I never caught that. I, I mean, didn't I either. And that was before. that was very interesting when I noticed that. I was like, oh, you, you, you can see the clearly kid mindset going on with this guy. He's just been so obsessed with all of this stuff from his childhood that it's, it's clearly affecting his adults' behaviors. Yeah, that, that is a really, that is really interesting, too, that you, that, that connection exist i didn't even think about it also could also because like dash said that really softly too so you could totally like miss that line yes and not even realize it's a it's a foreshadowing i guess of major events um oh so i think also one of the things it's so it's really interesting about this movie is that i've seen it both as a kid and i've also seen it as an adult so it's been really interesting for me to like think about who I relate to more and how my opinion of the movie changed over the years. And I mean, I think what's really, what I, what I really admire a lot of the movie is that it, it grounds itself so much in like real life problems, you know, like, like, you know, Bob Parr's midlife crisis is very relatable. You know, this feeling of not, of wanting to like, you know, return to his past because he feels like he, his life now sucks. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like that's a very common thing that happens to people, regardless of once they reach adulthood, whether you're in your 40s or your 50s or whatever. Um, and I, I think it's really great that there's that aspect to it. Um, and then um, I, I, I think it's also really great how, like, all the different, like, like, the kids are different ages. You know, like, Violet's 15, so she, like, is a good representation of, like, sort of the problems of like your average teenager, you know, not knowing how to fit in, being really concerned about how you appear with other people and Dash kind of wanting to, you know, just having all that energy and wanting to be the superhero um, and being kind of like the, the, the children's avatar, but like, that was so cool. <laughs> you know? So I, I, I think it's really great how the movie kind of touches on a lot of different aspects and you can sort of latch onto different people. Yes. Um, and relate to them that way. Um, yes. Yes, Noah. Um, I think the movie does an incredible... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we weren't going to get away without doing that once, I guess. <laughs> oh, I know. The movie, <laughs> the movie does an incredible job of really dealing with... Um, mature themes. I don't mean mature as in like blood and guts and gore and that, but even though they kind of do a little bit right. with the capes. Like the fact that the fact that really the 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 second into the third act is primarily about marital strife really it doesn't just push the boundaries of an animated movie to what one would think of as an animated movie, I think it really, it breaks a glass ceiling. Um, and I think that that was intentional because the director, Brad Bird, uh, speaks at great length about his thoughts on people calling it the animation genre. Because uh, he argues, and I would agree, that animation is not a genre. It is a, it is a type of art form. Just as Live action is not a genre. Um, now, more typically, because of its history, you know, Disney and such, um, animation is more associated with fairy tales. But even if you look at Disney, the first many films are very dark. I mean, you tell me Bambi oh, yeah. and people aren't scary. Like, but and I think I think this movie continues to. Be, and I do think it was one of the pioneers in this in this regard was really breaking the glass ceiling in terms of what families wanted to see and what even you know for lack of a better term what children would sit through 
because at the same time, they're seeing a guy who's trying desperately to get his superpower abilities back. He never loses them, but you know what I mean. Being able yes. to use them again. Yeah. What, you know, while older audiences are all like, wow, there is marital tension going on here, and there's miscommunications between adult relationships. And I think it's a very smart yeah. movie. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this... This uh, this movie really like in a very subtle way hints at that like Helen suspects Bob of having affairs. So you know, and that's not something you typically would think is in a Disney movie, but it's it, it is in this one. And I mean, they never come out and say that ever. Like I don't think she ever, ever even accuses him, or but, it's even ever brought up verbally. But you know, it's a thing. And, that's that does speak to like, this movie as I, in terms of like I think the only hint of her thinking that he that Bob is cheating on her is when Helen catches Bob and Mirage hugging. Pretty sure that's the only thing. Yeah. Like I that, that for that for like, like uh on screen like saying I this think... is what I'm thinking. Oh god. Right. I would I would argue against that that it I think it's clear when he's about to leave to go to what's the planet or what's the place called Iguanodon or something I don't even know so, what whatever whatever some, the island some is island, some some island somewhere when he's going to the thing and he is it's right after the uh, workout scene yes the, uh, and then there's the phone call and she picks it up and she like listens in on the hard line she listens and then as he's leaving. He's feeling really good about himself, getting in the car, and Helen comes up concerned to the car and says, like, hey, like, just so you know, I love you so much. And she's clearly concerned about what he's about to do, and he does not understand. He's like, I love you too. I'll be I'll be back. Because he is lying. He's just yes. not lying about the thing that she thinks he's lying yes. about. But I hold on. I will also counter that point. Because she knows Miss that she knows Bob's got a bit of like a trying to be a hero streak because we already see her catching him doing superhero heroics already. So my more question is whether she is thinking it's a marital thing or if it's like a big um superhero game thing. And regardless, and, and that, regardless, sorry, you know, yeah, you know. and regardless, whichever way she's thinking, I think the story would more present it at. Well, I personally think the more story presents it as like she's thinking like Bob's cheating on not being a superhero. But if that is the way you view the story, it is also very strong. Has very many strong parallels to a wife thinking that his her husband's cheating on him. And the way and. My final counter to this, because I think we should move on. Yes. Um, my final counter to that would be, I agree with everything that you said. However, I think that um, it's not just that weird phone call from this other woman that she doesn't know what's going on. I think it is also the fact that Bob has suddenly taken a much greater interest in his own self health mm -hmm. that he has been visibly a lot happier and he's making substantial efforts to get in shape and he's already he already has super strength so if you were working out and you already have super strength it's very easy for her to assume that he's working out to look better to present himself better to somebody else and i think that that's for what me tips it over the edge. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. So that was a yes. nice, frank discussion. Yes, that was very... My, my throwing my hat in the ring? Why not both? <gasps> true. It's presenting your dinner. Very true. Okay, anyway, um, so I'm going to completely twist this whole conversation into 180. But uh, Edna Mode, we got to talk about Yes. Her. Let me tell her, tell you, she is probably... One of the best, if not the best, comic book release in any Disney movie ever. And I might be stepping on a couple toes on that one, but like I don't care. She's great. Um, I 
first of all, I think the the concept behind it, you know, the fact that because like most of the time in superhero stories, the superheroes create their own clothes, you know, like Spider Man. Yeah. You see him doodling his super outfit. Batman obviously does all his stuff in house, but I think it's a really cool I, new idea to in concept to have you know the superheroes getting their costumes from a from a a, a fashion designer who also is like a scientist and like makes cloths mm-hmm. on her own. I think that's just a really cool concept, and I think that really makes sense for the universe they're going for. Yes. But aside from that, she she's great. Uh, like she has a great personality. She's just funny lines all around, mm-hmm. and I think what even makes her so great and so what what, what makes me really like her so much is how passionate she is about her fashion designing. Like she just she just loves what she does. Yeah. And she'll take any chance she can to like you know do what she needs to do. Well, here's a here's a thing I want to bring up that. Uh, it's not really seen because Edna Mode is a comedic character or really thought of, or maybe more, I should say. But Edna Mode goes through the exact same thing that all the superheroes who went undercover have to ha- have done because she can't make mm-hmm. the clothes anymore. She's still in her profession doing mm-hmm. what she oh, wanted to do. But it's clear that specifically what she's doing at the moment is not what she wants to be doing. Mm-hmm. she's working with supermodels and she's like, oh, I'm doing what I like, but, you know, it's not, you know, what I want to be doing. Like, Yeah, I got this job to, to yeah. because it's still in my field. That's not what I really want to be doing. And she goes so, like, all of her dialogues, like, I'm doing this, even though she, like, spins it like, oh, don't beg me, darling, don't beg. And she's like, I'm doing this for you guys because I want to, I need this. Yeah. yeah. Just as bad as Bob, but she just has more of an other outlet. Um, but I think something that's uh, funny, and I do want to just point this out because this is something that goes un unseen for a lot of viewers, is that you uh you you know the scene where um Elastic Girl is crying and um and Edna Mode hits her with the toilet paper hits her with the paper towel saying pull yourself together. Um mm-hmm. A funny little detail in that scene is that um, Edna Mode is offering Helen, as she's crying, toilet paper. Which means Edna Mode does not have tissues because there is no crying in E's house. (laughs) No crying allowed. So when somebody cries, she has to make do with what she has. And I think that is a wonderful little power detail mm-hmm. that goes mm-hmm. unnoticed a lot. Because I noticed, yeah. I, I recognized like, oh, she's not giving her tissue. She's just taking pieces of toilet paper, of uh, paper towels and giving it to her to, to, to cry into. And it's like, oh, huh. Mm-hmm. But that is a very interesting yeah. point. Speaking of also really great little details, it's the lots of character development. Um, well, not character development, just character. Um, Bob's boss, whose name I forget, he's voiced by the guy from, from Princess Bride. By the way, great casting. Beautiful casting. Anyway, one of the great ways that you can just tell what kind of guy this is is when he's going to office and you see him sharpening the pencil and then laying it on the counter. And then when Bob sits down, he like moves it back to where it was. And you can just tell just in those scenes, this guy is super strict. He likes everything in his place. And if something can go slightly wrong, he's not happy about it. And you can get all of that just from those scenes. You don't need him to tell you that. You don't need any any really tiger to be like, be careful. This boss is like really strict. Like, yeah. they just show that to you. And that's like a really yeah, great character that I love a lot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's a great, great. Um, Minor antagonist, I should say. A final thing, or do you want to do a final thing? Because I have a final idea, but please go first. Okay. You can go. Okay. Well, I just wanted to pose the final a final question because my time's running a little short, and I figured we can talk about this. Um, unlike every single Pixar sequel to date, uh, which has either gone forward or backwards in time a significant amount. The sequel is actually starting the exact same 
frame that the original leaves up. So in the in the original, again, spoiler, at the very end, the underminer comes in and wreaks havoc or is planning is to wreak yeah. havoc on the town. And the Incredibles family suits up and is about to fight him. And that's precisely where the second movie ends. I just thought we could talk about um, what we think about starting the story immediately where it left off because at the end, the epilogue of the original movie ties up these characters' stories and their arcs so wonderfully that what do you think about um, the film starting precisely where that where it leaves off so that they have new arcs? Uh, so this is a very interesting juxtaposition because the whole point of the first film was Mr. Incredible is the one uncomfortable unfulfilled with his normal life while Helen has at least accepted it, whether how to what extent, it's not necessarily certain, but it's accepted enough that she doesn't like dream of being a superhero every five minutes. Um but she's the one that becomes a superhero and now it's Mr. Incredible that has to be the stay at home dad. Because as far as we know, Helen didn't have a job. So she was probably a stay at and also with the time period being like in the seventies, it make would make more sense 60s. for sixties. It would make more, more right, yes. Um, wrong decade. Okay. That that time period would also make sense for Helen to be a stay at home mother as opposed to being out of the field, am I right? Yes. So then yeah. there's no necessary not any indication she's got a job. So she'd probably stay at home. But now it's Bob being stay at home, so we're just flipping the roles and seeing how they function in the different paths pretty much yeah and it it does it's, it is really interesting you have the character arc too because i think i mean to me the big the big thing that their movie's going to tackle and i think from the trails that i have seen it is what it's going to tackle is now that the super user may be back what's the next step after that you know yes. how will they come back will they come back can yeah. they come back yes you know? that's a very good i question. think that's probably what's going to be the big thing yes. to this this uh uh um thing for this movie, at least. Yes. And, I, yeah, I guess that maybe brings a little bit of concern, too, because that is a good point, Noah, that, like, the this movie does very much conclude on itself. And it, it while it does imply that there's more adventures, it, it also isn't opening, didn't, like, leave it open for, for a sequel possibility. Like, yes. it wasn't anticipating a sequel. So right. that also kind of makes it a little bit nervous. Like, will they undo stuff that was previously established in the first movie mm -hmm. you know um and again the fact that this has been you know 14 years potentially in, um since since the original that can also make things different especially if they're starting on the exact same thing a lot of time has passed you know a lot of things can happen creatively yeah. at least right? yeah that's the biggest concern that that a lot of yeah that's probably the biggest concern with incredibles too a lot of real world time has passed but no in world time has passed, so making sure that the stories work together properly and feels good for the audience, that's the important thing to anticipate for this movie. But hey, I mean, uh, Frozone's wife's going to be back, so... Yeah! I may. I did do some research, and it turns out that the, um, the creative team worked Long hours trying to design Frozone's mom or Frozone's mom, Frozone's wife, and they were trying to figure out who could possibly be attached to this wonderful voice. And after all of this, they said, "You know what? She's just funnier if she's always off screen." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. They have at least got that yeah. right. Um, but um, we could probably talk about a lot more different things. Um, but. Noah does have to get going, so we do have to cut this off here, but I think we can all say, um, well, I'll at the very least say, this is a, if I may pun, an incredible movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This but, is certainly up there with Iron Man in terms of, like, legendary uh, superhero movies. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely same thing for me. I think The Incredibles is definitely up there as far as Pixar movies go. Um, 
it's also I even think up there in terms of just animated movies in general. It's really solid. Has a great cast, great story, great animation that yeah. holds up even today. And like animation has gone a lot. Like you know, a lot of early two thousand stuff looks kind of in, in, in yeah. the animation department sometimes, but in this case it looks it still looks great. Yes. Um, and yeah, and yeah, just if you haven't seen it yet, or if you haven't seen it in a while, go see it. It's a great, 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 great movie. You yes. Not look at your time. Definitely <laughs> recommendations from all of us. Um, but before you go, Noah, uh, where can people find you if they want to find you? You can find me on Instagram at Noah Sunday Leftwitz or on YouTube, also Noah Sunday Leftwitz. Yeah. Alyssa, uh, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter, at The Rational Dove. I also make appearances at, on Anime Overdrive and occasionally Awesome Asylum. I actually make a cameo on that. On movie. Steel City Bot, on the Nerdy Geek on, Talk YouTube on channel. On Nerdy, Nerdy Geek Talk. So if you follow that, that's where you can also get my yep. And as for me, my uh, social media is in my outro. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, please like and share this video and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow me on Twitter, at, on Twitter, Instagram, and on Twitter. No, I forget my outro now. On Twitter and Instagram at soundjack426. You can also, uh, if you also want to, you can also support me on Patreon. All of the links for that will be in the description below. Thanks for tuning in. This is Soundjack, Alyssa, and Noah signing off.